Okay, we have a lot of ground to cover today. So I think let's uh, get started. And uh, if people are still joining us, well, we have a couple minutes of introductions to go through uh, before we get too far. So welcome everybody to today's webinar on approaches to temperature TMDLs. Um, we're really excited to have presenters from both coasts um, and a whole bunch of different experiences with us today. Uh, we're gonna leave lots of time for questions, but we also just wanna make sure that we cover a few important housekeeping pieces before so that once we get to the end, it's all time for questions. Um, if this is your first time attending one of these webinars, um, just a quick introduction to Nui Pick. Uh, we are a regional commission that helps the states of the Northeast pr uh, preserve and advance water quality. With support from EPA, we've been running this webinar series since 2016 as part of our work to develop, coordinate, and conduct training programs uh, that serve water quality professionals regionally and nationwide. Uh, this webinar series kind of taps into that nationwide, and we have a huge range of topics and parts of the country that we focused on for this series, and we're excited to be continuing it for at least the next couple of years. Um, I suspect that many more of us are familiar with GoToWebinar than we may have been, say, back in March, uh, but just a couple of pointers. Uh, there's two options for audio, so you can either use your, your computer speakers, which um, if you have good internet connection is usually a pretty safe bet. If your internet connection is sounding a little off or you don't necessarily trust it, you, you can also call in by phone. If you look at your kind of dashboard on the side and you click the audio, you should see the option for a phone call and it will give you all the information you need to uh, join in. You are going to be muted by default for the duration of this presentation. We, that doesn't mean that we don't wanna hear from you. We just are gonna use some other ways to hear from you. Um, if you look in that same dashboard, you'll see the chat window. Please ask questions throughout the webinar, even if you, you know, think that it might get touched on later on. Ask the questions. I'd rather ask more questions and then filter through them later. Um, and I will kind of jump in and, and ask questions mostly at the end of the presentation. If you're having technical difficulties, if you can't see the screen, if you are having trouble hearing, uh, you can also click that raise hand button, which is just below the mute button that should be muted for all of you. Uh, so this raise hand button will let me know that you need a hand and I will send you a chat and we, we can help figure it out. At the end of the webinar, there will be another opportunity to use your voice. Uh, it'll A short survey will, will pop up. We really read all of these and use them to shape the future of the program and we really appreciate your thoughtful input. So please fill that out. Um, one of the, the questions there is the, is the future topic that you'd like to see covered. There's actually a relatively new way for you to uh, propose ideas for future webinars. Um, if you look in the handout section of your dashboard, you, you can actually download a PDF with all the information. Uh, we have a project team made up of state, federal, and tribal uh, water quality staff from around the country who review these applications and help shape the future of the webinar series. Um, we have uh, a bunch of priority topics, but we also uh, have funding. So if you want to develop a new project, um, we have some limitations on uh, who can apply for funding, but uh, for, for some applicants, we are able to pay you to develop a really interesting webinar for this series. We actually have two webinars that we're working on for this fall and winter, so stay tuned uh, for a webinar on applying environmental justice and integrating and kind of weaving environmental justice into 303D and TMDL programs. Uh, we're working on that right now. We are also working on a really cool webinar focused on impervious cover impairments, um, especially focused on how different groups can partner to really address these, these types of impairments. So, Stay tuned for more information. We'll, we'll be getting that out in the next couple of months. Uh, if there's more topics you wanna hear about, there's a chance that we already covered them. And just like today's presentation, they will all be recorded. So check out our web archives. Uh, you can uh, log in and check out all of the recordings uh, from our previous webinars. So check that out. We have four years of cool webinars uh, to review. Now, 
Before we dive into today's uh, presentation on temperature TMDLs, we'd like to hear from all of you. So I'm about to launch a poll in a second. Uh, we have two different polling questions, and this is kind of to get a sense of who's in the virtual room um, and, and your experiences with temperature TMDLs. So each of these polling questions are going to come up on your screen one at a time. Uh, there's some browser and operating system glitches, and sometimes it won't let you actually click. If you are in full screen, try leaving full screen. If you're in not full screen, try entering full screen. Um, depending on your browser or your operating system, that usually fixes it. So the first question, which should be launching now, is whether your state has a listing methodology for temperature impairment. Looks like we are getting a bunch of our um, responses in. I'm gonna give it about 15 more seconds. Looks like a lot of you do have some sort of temperature listing methodology. So let's close. Okay, so it looks like about a little over half um, have some sort of temperature listing methodology. A handful more are in the process of developing one, and there's about 30% of you who don't have this right now. Um, it's a really interesting breakdown, and it'll help inform the rest of our conversation. Um, related, the next question gets specifically towards TMDLs. So does your state have temperature TMDLs? And we'll keep this one open for about 30 seconds as well. Very interesting. I'm gonna give you guys about three more seconds. And let's see the results here. Uh, so it looks like while more than half of you have a listing methodology, almost half don't have any temperature TMDL. So hopefully today's webinar will uh, kind of provide some inspiration and frameworks. Um, although there are quite a few who are either already have approved or in the process of approving temperature TMDLs. Now, time to hear more from other people and not from me. Uh, so we're going to start off today with Anna Casco and Jonathan Lyman from the Maryland Department of the Environment's Integrated Water Planning Program, where Anna is a senior regulatory and compliance engineer and has worked in the TMDL program uh, since 2005. Jonathan works on a variety of water management issues related to the development of TMDLs and watershed implementation plans. Um, after we hear from them about their process, we'll hear another perspective on temperature TMDLs from the other side of the continent, uh, Lori Mann and Ben Cope of EPA Region 10 in the Pacific Northwest. Lori is an environmental engineer who's worked in the TMDL program almost 25 years. She's EPA's state program manager for the Washington TMDL program. Ben is an environmental engineer with the science division at Region 10. He provides scientific support for watershed restoration efforts in the region, including TMDLs. And again, we will leave plenty of time for questions. Please add them to the questions box throughout the presentation. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from you. So now, without further ado, let me hand things over to Anna. Always the unmute. Hey, everybody. Um, good afternoon on the East Coast, and I guess good morning on the West Coast. I have my presentation up, and I'm going to try to get into um, presenter mode. Sorry about that. Okay, so can everyone see the presentation? Yep, looks good. Okay. 
So yeah, as Emma said, my name is Anna Costco. I'm with the Maryland Department of the Environment. I have worked um, for 15 years in PMDL development, mostly sediment and nutrients. Um, also done trash and now temperature is on my list of things. Um, we started this project approximately four years ago. Um, we began listing for temperature and then we started doing some monitoring, which I'll get through. So let me just go ahead and start the presentation. So why first is, we probably know already, but put a couple simple slides of why we do temperature TMDLs. Um, temperature is obviously a big influence on aquatic life and many aquatic life species have a preferred temperature range. Um, it's a major influence on feeding, reproduction, and growth. And also temperature can affect chemical parameters in the water, um, specifically with a higher temperature, you get a decrease in dissolved oxygen. In Maryland, the species that our um, regulations are written to are the Eastern Brook Trout. I'm sure that's different uh, for the West Coast, obviously, and um, some of you may may share this species and some of you have not, um, but we have found the literature value that of 68 degrees F or 20 C, and that's what we set up our criteria to be. So for those, I'm sure most of you are familiar, but um, the basic process is that we do an assessment, uh, then it gets on the integrated report, and then we have a PMDL. So the first, I wanted to cover everything. Um, sorry about that. Some of this contains what we're actually doing and some of its lessons learned. So hopefully um, other people can find this useful throughout the country. So in Maryland, our designated use criteria, uh, we have four use classes. The TMDL that we're developing now is use class three, uh, non-tidal cold water, which represents um, naturally reproducing trout waters. We also have a use class four, which is a little bit higher temperature, which contains stock trout. Um, we begin the process with data, of course. Uh, Maryland has a program called Maryland Biological Stream Survey. I've included a lot of helpful links to this. Program is um, through our sister agency, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. This MBSS program is a random sampling method and it's designed to assess the entire state. Uh, covers many chemical and physical habitat parameters and also, um, I can't remember the year, but they started recording air and water temperature samples. So as you see, just trying to provide some thoughts on what we did, we used a 20, that data set used a 20 minute interval. As you'll see later, we did some more monitoring and um, we used a 15 minute interval, but just some things to think about if you're starting to collect data or if you already have data, if it seems compatible, um, that's kind of the scale that we're on. So once we had the data set and we decided to use that, um, this is kind of a lesson learned. We developed what I've marked here as impairment listing methodology one. Um, we were finding that we had some trout waters where the temperature was exceeding, but we were still finding trout and other cold water obligates in the streams. Um, so we, in that case, wanted to use category three, that we needed to collect more data. Uh, you can see from the chart that um, obviously, if the temperature was good, we were putting in category two unimpaired, um, you know, and then using category three and category five, whether we found species or not. I think this methodology was developed in 2014. Sometime later, the EPA told us that um, this was not consistent with what they call independent applicability so that we move to 
impairment listing methodology too. And basically, if it's not meeting the temperature criteria, which we use 90th, 90th percentile, um, less than 20 degrees C, then it had to be listed as impaired. And I've put the link at the bottom to, to that listing methodology. So in addition, when we really began the TMDL development, um, like I said, the MBSS captures a statewide picture of temperatures and we wanted to focus on specific watersheds. So we did a lot more monitoring, again, similar to, to the MBSS, air temperature, water temperature, 15 minute intervals. We're compiling the data to the daily average um, and looking at the 90th percentile, which is our impairment metric. So the next, after we collected that data, we began our TMDL development. First step, we obviously didn't want to recreate the wheel and we looked at what other states were doing. Um, we saw that a number of states already had TMDLs and from our poll, we see a number of you have TMDLs already. Um, Obviously, the East Coast is different than the West Coast. And what we were seeing in the TMDLs that were already done is that it was the forested watersheds that were impacted by logging. Uh, we don't have that on the, in Maryland. Um, but we did use the concept that we were going to express our TMDL in terms of thermal energy loads. So without a methodology from other states, um, Oh, and this, sorry, this is just a slide showing the different variables. I'm sure most of us know already that water is influenced by numerous natural variables. So we have a, um, you know, a lot of inputs into the model. It's, it's a difficult parameter to model. So just an overview of the modeling. First, we do our hydrology modeling. Then we do bring in the temperature component. Um, and then we do various scenarios to see what changes we make to the to the environment to get to our to our 20 degrees C. Um, and again, we're using thermal energy um, as our endpoint. So the model we chose to use is SWAT, the Soil and Water Assessment Tool, um, which is out. Uh, I feel like Arizona, but I don't know right now. Um, anyway, the link is on the bottom. It is a publicly available model. Uh, obviously, always a good choice for everybody. Um, certainly, if, if anybody was interested in using it and wanted to talk to us, we'd be happy to do so. I'm not actually the model. My modeler, my colleague Guido is, um, but we wanted to keep this presentation simple today. So. Just a brief overview, it is SWAT. You can read all about it at the link at the bottom. It's a physically based continuous model um, to predict land management practices on water. Um, it was initially developed as a hydrology model and it, as you can see, contains numerous, numerous um, components to, to give us the best model. We did develop in partnership um, with the NGO a uh, automatic calibration procedure for, for the SWAT model. So that was a little something we added on and again, like something we could talk offline about. Um, basic calibration, I'm sure we've all shown this calibration in, in numerous presentations and slides, but we had to get the hydrology right first. Um, and I did want to say uh, the, the bottom picture is of the first watershed that we were doing. Um, we modeled to the outlet of that watershed, which is a larger area than the use class three, but that's where we had USGS gauges. So I just wanted to say that too. That's a great data source is the USGS flow gauges. 
After you have your hydrology calibrated, then we're going to bring in the temperature parameters. Um, meteorologically, I believe we used a NASA database, um, but this is where you bring in your groundwater and your rainfall, surface runoff, snow melt, um, and then the temp the model calculates in three steps. First, you take your hydrologic uh, inputs, then you uh, in the action within the subbasin, then you add in upstream, and then add in the heat transfer from air and water. So. Um, again, I'm not the modeler, but I'm sure anyone will, he'd be happy to talk with anybody about this. So once I got, once we got the calibration done, then we're going to run different scenarios to see what we need to change in the land use to meet our temperature goal. Um, this first watershed that we did was our urban watershed. And so the two parameters that we're changing is the percent impervious retrofit and the percent riparian cover. Um, those were the two variables we had to work with. And again, this is just a sample of what we did. Um, just really kind of taking educated guesses on what types, how we should change the percentages until we we got to where we wanted to be. This is just a simple, once we, the, the output of the model is going to be a temperature and flow. Once we got that, then we can translate that into thermal energy and develop a TMBL equation based on um, gigajoules per day. And this is my final slide, which we'll hand off, I'll hand off to Jonathan after that. Um, but what do you do after you write this TMGL and you go through this whole process? You have to do implementation. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, um, in this particular watershed that we're working, we used urban retrofit and riparian canopy, which was a 50 meter buffer. Um, we are using municipal separate storm sewer system permits um, as the mechanism to, to create the implementation. And within that permit, there's also a waste load allocation implementation plan requirement. Um, in Maryland, we have also, several years ago, and then we're redoing them now, begin providing implementation guidances. So I will hopefully pass this off to Jonathan, and he can start um, talking more about implementation. Oh, and one more. If you, oh, I lost my slide, sorry. All right, Jonathan, to you. All right, um, thanks, Anna. And take it from the top here. So, Anna is a seasoned veteran in our program, and I've come in to try and um, bridge the gap, so to speak, that exists between um, TMDL development um, and implementation. Um, it's it's a large um, gap to bridge. Um, I know for for a lot of states and jurisdictions, um, because there's not always a requirement to actually implement TMDLs, and so we're trying to to take a different approach um, than we have in the past at the department to this, and I'll get into the ins and outs of that. Um, so I, I straddle again, TMDL development and watershed restoration. Um, we also have the water and sewer plan review group um, that's that's part of um, the integrated water planning program. Um, so essentially it, it seems as though the logic behind the development of IWIP um, suits a project like this quite well because it's trying to take information that's seemingly um, disjointed and disconnected um, and bring that together. Um, so here's an outline of what we're going to talk about today. Um, the mission. Ultimately, um, the mission that uh, we have is to support some wild trout. Um, that's the purpose of this entire effort in the state of Maryland, and I'd imagine it's very similar um, in some of the other states um, where Anna had mentioned we've gone to, to look for background information. 
Um, so we'll discuss a little bit about TMDLs um, just real quick because Anna went over that, um, designated uses, um, and then how um, this particular implementation guidance has a lot of relationship, has a lot of relations uh, to, to other guidances we're developing for bacteria um, or for sediment and nutrients. Um, and then this concept of resource-based water quality management, which um, I was introduced to a number of years ago uh, with work at the American Fisheries Society. Um, and then how to do that work spatially in order to help our jurisdictions prioritize where work is going. Um, so let's dive in here. So in Maryland, um, we have uh, use class designations. And so our use class three, which you see here underlined in black um, and bolded, um, is our non-tidal cold water. These are the waters we're talking about today um, that TMDLs are written for. And also just wanted to make a note, I'll mention this a few times throughout the presentation, um, that we have this use class P tag that goes along with all of our um, different use classes, and that denotes, excuse me, water supply. So that could be water supply for drinking, it could be for irrigation. Um, so here's a map of where these use class three waters are in the state. They're the, they're the teal green waters. Um, so you can see some are located, uh, what is Baltimore Carroll County, um, north of Baltimore City and north of Washington, D.C. Um, and then we also have the stronghold of a lot of our native brook trout are out in Western Maryland and Appalachia and Garrett and Allegheny counties. And um, then if you see those small black spots on your screen, um, that's uh, the checkered pattern is it's just to denote um, where use class P waters are in the state. However, if you were to zoom in, this is a public facing um, web tool. So if you were to go to this website um, on MDE's homepage, um, you would see that most of the waters that are west of Interstate 95 in Maryland are actually use class P surface waters. Um, so we're, de we're dealing with multiple designated uses layered on top of one another, which is obviously not that uncommon, um, but I'll get to the point here of including that um, water supply designated use and how that could provide some guidance um, to jurisdictions. Um, so just to run through real quick, um, Anna went through this already, um, but what makes up a TMDL? Well, really what we're interested in talking about today with you guys um, is the waste load allocation component. And within that waste load allocation component um, is the stormwater waste load allocation. In Maryland, um, we have sprawling subdivisions that have created an impervious layer of, of, of pavement um, that goes on for, for a ways. Um, and so we have many stormwater permits associated with that environmental stressor. Um, so anywhere in the state where in the early 90s, there was over 100,000 people living at that time. We have phase one stormwater permits. Um, that phase one just denotes it was the first round of permits um, that came out. And as I'll get, here in a, get to here in a second, those permits have special conditions. And these aren't um, small, you know, relatively small, you know, uh, boilerplate permits. These are, these are really, really enormous permits that have a tremendous amount of data um, that are required to be reported to the state. Um, so, you know, this statement here is sort of just a way of getting to the next slide, but see the ideal approach for achieving actual reductions. Progress is a combination of modeling tools and BMPs, the spatially oriented process and methods and data collection. Okay, well, what does that really mean? Well, that means we need a methodology. We need a process. And I'm not telling everybody on this call, I'm sure I would, would agree with these statements, but I think it's important for us to start from the bottom up, um, which is you need to develop a robust and curated reference list. If you're gonna pass on to a jurisdiction, a guidance that's worthwhile to try and implement something as complicated as a temperature TMDL. You need a, you need a robust and well-curated reference list. You need information hubs that are also well-curated, um, and you need a temperature database to aggregate that information. And so I included a link here. We won't go to the website right now, but I included a hyperlink. Um, I believe Emma's gonna post these presentations after the after that we're all done here. So it's worthwhile to check around at uh, Washington State's Freshwater Information Network, which I thought was one of the the better platforms I've found across, across the country. So again, back to these idea of these stormwater permits. So within the permits within the state of Maryland, we have a requirement. If there's a waste load allocation that's assigned within a jurisdiction, and in Maryland, our jurisdictions are counties. And then with a, with a few caveats, there's some other you know, state entities like our state highways that also have these permits. Um, they have a requirement to develop an implementation plan for all applicable pollutants. So that's not just temperature, that's bacteria, that's sediment, so on and so forth. So this is again, sort of like generally how the state of Maryland is trying to deal with, with that gap that exists between TMDL development and how are we gonna get the work on the ground in a way that's meaningful. 
these permits um, in the state of Maryland require about four or five basic elements to be included in them. And now some counties, some of our jurisdictions, again, will develop a countywide plan to develop um, a, a path forward to, to meet their waste load allocations. But within the, all these plans, they must meet these requirements. So this is some pretty uh, high level planning information, which requires them to hire consultants and generate plans for, again, for bacteria, for sediment, for temperature. So as these temperature TMDLs get put out there, um, we're going to be start getting these plans in for review. So they need to include information on schedules of products, projects, excuse me, programs with end dates, counting of costs, detailed monitoring, modeling, and specific adaptive management processes. We'll get you, well, I'll talk about more here in a minute. Um, and then also, you know, talking about public engagement, which is something that's usually glazed over first, but something that, you know, I, I'm the one who's in charge in the state of reviewing these plans that are coming in, um, you know, is, is, is the public engagement technologically relevant? I think that's also something as we're dealing here with more and more stresses on our water resources, you know, are we really reaching the masses with a newspaper um, posting that, you know, that there's a public meeting coming up? So thinking critically about those and providing comments to our jurisdictions about, you know, sort of jumping, you know, both feet first into, into the 21st century as far as how we're broadcasting messages about natural resource management. So this is just a, a quick listing of these phase one counties so everybody, you know, can get an idea of where we're talking about in space, you know, spatially here in the state of Maryland. Most of these counties have at least some um, use class three waters. Again, those cold waters that these temperature TMDLs are being written for. Um, so how are we broadcasting this message of, of guidance, you know, of how to, how to guide these jurisdictions to implement for temperature? Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, you know, outlining the presentation, we're doing that through pushing the idea of the designated use, the resource base within your jurisdiction is the way in which you're going to gather support and momentum to get work done at the end of the day, to get projects in the ground and to find out where potential exists um, to either, you know, maintain current water temperatures or if need be, get those thermal reductions. So in the case of, um, you know, use class three in case a case of, you know, cold waters, we're talking wild fisheries here. But I just threw in here, for example, some of the other, you know, designated uses that we all have in our states, whether they be reservoirs, irrigation, uh, water appropriations for any number of uses, um, beaches, public bathing. In, the, in Maryland, we have an aquaculture and a fisheries designated use, um, as well as agricultural water supply. And how our, our designated uses that are outlined in, in Clean Water Act language also begin to blend over into other regulatory environments like you know bacterial quality of agricultural water supply. So these are again we're starting to see oh, okay there's partners out on the, out on the information landscape that we should be looking to, to to partner with to get this work done. Um, so what I'm what I'm trying the point I'm trying to get across here is you know we need a process not just a framework. We need a way to to orient this immense amount of information that we have at our disposal as state as state agencies, um, as you know, as, as as local bureaucrats, how can we begin to bring all this information together? Now in Maryland, we're lucky to have the Chesapeake Bay um, program, who's driven you know an interjurisdictional TMDL for for the Chesapeake Bay already, and in doing so, we've already developed you know pretty robust partnerships, um, as Anna alluded to, with our Department of Natural Resources, both the Fisheries and Forest Service. Um, but also with our Department of Planning, Department of Health, Department of Agriculture, and then also within the state along the Internet, Interstate 95 corridor, um, we have three well-established um, water supply work groups that, that their primary goal is to, you know, ask research questions that need to be answered to protect public water. Um, so like Potomac River Basin Drinking Water Source Protection Partnership is an interstate organization that goes out there and essentially is trying to safeguard through data synthesis and good science, um, you know, the waters that are coming down the Potomac River Basin and similar for the Patuxent River and for the Baltimore City Reservoir System. So how do we want our jurisdictions to measure this progress, you know, once they've begun to ask these questions and collect information? Um, not all actions can be explicitly represented in available models. Um, and we still want our jurisdictions to maintain their authority, but with a purpose, you know, it's not just sort of like, well, you're the county and I'm the state and you have to do what I say. And this is, you know, or, you know, your authority stops here state, we're the county, we get to make decisions. 
the idea is to to convey to the the jurisdiction that hey you have these fishery resources in your county and that's part of the reason why people want to live there is because of the high quality of water that you have there people come there to fish people come there to live so on and so forth um and also you know what i've alluded to a second ago is, is trying to bridge this gap between the clean water act and the safe drinking water act in terms of the data that these two pieces of legislation require us um you know the data that's being generated from both of these pieces of legislation is is really important and it fits together quite nicely when we begin to to pull it out and, and clean it up and see what's actually you know what's actually there so again just to review what we've been talking about here is the fishery what we need to be protecting through this tmdl are cold water obligate species spawning in nursery habitat ensuring adequate food organisms and maintaining fish passage but our impairments, you know, keeping us from doing that are, like mentioned before, impervious surfaces, dams. We have a tremendous amount of old dam structures in this part of the country um, from early settlement, some of which have been dewatered, some which still have water. Um, those in, in and of themselves are, are, are thermal hotspots on the landscape, which our Department of Natural Resources has begun to try to mitigate um, some of those issues. Groundwater withdrawals, drain tile and ditching, deforestation. These are all stressors we're all familiar with. Um, as folks who, who work in this sector. Um, but again, how can we begin to, you know, pair up, you know, this on the one hand, we have this fishery we need to protect. And on the other, we've got this diverse array of stressors out on the landscape. Well, the best, is we can, best we can do is begin to see where's the information that can help us link risk and resource together. And in the state here so far, you know, this is a work in progress for us. Um, and through this presentation, hoping to get feedback on this approach. And if there's other places we need to be looking that we haven't, um, you know, internally at the Department of the Environment, we've we've knocked on the door for the water supply program, our sediment, stormwater, and dam safety folks, um, obviously our environmental assessments and standards, the folks who are generating the criteria in the first place and putting putting um, impaired waters on the 303D list, um, as well as our you know high quality waters program tier two, um, and then obviously the NIPTES program. A lot of this information is traditionally viewed in a compliance context, but now that we're, you know, established decades worth of information, we're sitting on a treasure trove of planning information that we can begin to combine um, with, other, with other agencies like our DNR, from other jurisdictions like our count, like the county or the federal government, um, and then also through non-governmental par non partners. For example, Nature Conservancy has developed the fish passage GIS data layer in this part of the country. That's not something we've been able to generate on our own because we don't have a regulatory mechanism to do that. So it's pretty powerful to be able to go out there and sort of, you know, begin to see what what else is out there as far as information and data um, that we can use to to help us convey to the counties where they need to be doing work. I'm not going to go down this whole list of, uh, you know, of issues that we're you know considering and, and eventually maybe we want to begin to bridge our TMDL to an ecological model. But again, just the complexity that it takes to, to take a TMDL model on, on thermal impairments, which in my mind really amounts to, to sort of like a habitat suitability evaluation um, with how to do inland fisheries management. And so bridging these two types of science together is gonna be imperative to, to convey to, to our jurisdictions how best to do this. And then still obviously communicate that in a way where you know, local resource managers on top of all the other pressures they have and all the other projects they have can be effective in managing for temperature impairments. Um, so one thing we're requiring them is to view this on a, you know, on a long-term basis. We're not looking for return on investment right away, but as a result, we need to see short, mid and long-term planning horizons with, re with regard to BMP effectiveness, watershed scale progress, and obviously the fishery itself. And if anybody's interested, we have a biological stressor, stressor methodology in the state, um, which is actually pretty concise and, and fairly easy to, to wade through. Um, but within that document, there's submetrics that can feed into these reporting requirements that we have in these stormwater permits. So whether that be, you know, a county for years, they're just going to look at, you know, what's going on with the presence or absence of beaver ponds, or whether it be channelization, or some of these other metrics that are more dynamic when we actually get down in a watershed and see what's going on. Again, just going to breeze through this slide fairly quickly, but this this idea of short, mid, and long term it, it actually lends itself 
pretty well to absorbing information that's coming out of the literature. For example, um, Bob Hildebrand, who works in our in Maryland at, at the University of Maryland um, in the Appalachian Lab, um, basically established some short, mid, and long-term um, planning horizons for jurisdictions already. Now, whether we want to, you know, hold the jurisdictions to these on some certain time frame is definitely up for discussion, but it provides us with a place to start. For example, just in terms of, you know, short term, limit the maximum daily temperature fluctuation um, to less than nine degrees Celsius. In a lot of cases, that's a very large ask, um, especially if you've got a highly urbanized cold water stream. However, in some cases it may not. So maybe we, you know, we're, we can easily achieve that short term goal and then we can move on to the midterm. But anyway, wanted to just share this idea that because we're working in a permitted structure and a regulatory structure, you know, we're, we're, we can ask for an iterative approach. We can ask for things to be adaptively managed. And so again, something I mentioned before is just that reporting um, on progress is not just for compliance sake. You know, we want obviously those permits that exist, those compliance measures that exist, they're there for a reason. I'm not saying that they're not, but there's added value in going out there and, and uncovering some of this information um, and begin to look at it spatially and put it out in a GIS, in a GIS platform and say, where's the potential to really mitigate? Where's the potential to get trout back on the landscape or to protect trout that are already there? Um, so, and it's also an, you know, because we're in this sort of gray area, again, bridging a TMDL to implementation, you know, we can help the county, we can work with the county to say, where are the operational constraints? Um, you know, are you open to the idea of interjurisdictional water, you know, watershed management for temperature? Um, and this is something, again, here's a link if anybody's interested after the presentation, um, the methodology used out uh, in the Northwest by the U.S. Forest Service um, to aggregate information is incredibly helpful. Um, and because the whole process, again, this methodology by going through, you know, step by step, how to gather this information, it will help the counties or whatever, however your jurisdictions are structured, identify data gaps and how to perceive future pressures or risks that may exist um, on cold water resources. BMPs and implementation, um, this is an emerging science as far as, you know, how do we get acute thermal reductions from a BMP? A lot of our BMPs in the state um, are oriented towards reducing for nutrients for the Chesapeake Bay and for sediments. Um, but generally, you know, we can think of BMPs being broken down into two large categories. You know, these acute delta stormwater management facilities where we're seeing a, you know, a measurable drop in nitrogen, for example. How do we, can, how do, we do that for temperature? So that's the emergence, emerging science. And some of these land use change practices, whether it be, um, you know, replanting forests or, or riparian restoration, um, you know, those changes that were put in the landscape, we're not going to see the, the perceived benefit for decades in some cases. So again, how do we... How do we get the jurisdiction to feel as though what they're investing in is worthwhile, but also hold their hand for a little while so their reporting metrics are in line with the practices they're putting in with the ground in the ground? So one of my last slides here, adaptive management is not a catchphrase. Um, I have a natural resource background, and one of the my pet peeves is when folks throw around the term adaptive management um, as, as something like, oh, it's trial and error. Um, hoping most of the folks on the call already have, have sort of background in, in this that adaptive management is not a catchphrase it is not trial and error um, it's a technical process that requires management triggers it requires folks who are working to manage a natural resource um, to have those short mid and long term horizons um, and then if if a target is not mixed if, if a target is not hit um, then what is the man, what is the threshold for for triggering an action um, so and again how do we do that with keeping the idea in, in mind that we're always working towards protecting that fishery? This takes some creativity in terms of reporting. Um, it can't, we can't report always just based on temperature. So does a county then report based on, you know, how much water, you know, this is particularly relevant to the, to the Western United States, but how much water is appropriated and put into trust. Um, so it makes sure it's, you know, it's flowing downstream. Are there irrigation improvements going in in the county to reduce the amount of water usage? What about road improvements? Road improvements are something that our state highway administration works with a lot. So how can we get them to view their BMPs in terms of you know, thermal reductions and not just nutrient reductions? So to wrap up, um, you know, we're looking to develop a process, a methodology that works to sustain wild trout in Maryland, particularly brook trout. That's our only native trout 
It's our only native cell mod in the state, and that's what our criteria are based on. Um, I would recommend to other folks, and I'd love to get feedback, but you know, using using designated uses as the as the far out horizon for what we're really working towards, I think really assists in in giving a constituency in a jurisdiction something to say like this is real, this is tangible, this is not just another burdensome um, government you know regulation or document. We you know we care about the fishery in our jurisdiction. Um, and again, we're we're working towards doing this in, in a spatial format. A lot of our reporting structures are pushing um, digital, and they're also report they're also pushing towards um, being spatial in nature, meaning using GIS. I've found that GIS tools are very widespread. Um, they're increasingly affordable, and the user experience is is, is increasingly um, easier. So you know our local jurisdictions who may not have very robust staffs can still interact um, with with these programs. And the last plug I'd say I didn't I didn't speak about this as much as I would have liked to, um, but really try to connect um, and it's something I'm you know making the case for in, in Maryland is try to connect the Clean Water Act to the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, there's nothing more important in, in any of our jurisdictions, state or county, um, than water supply, um, and it's something that you know we're not. Everybody's a salesman in some regard, so it, it sells very well, I found, when you're trying to make a case for doing projects and finding that overlap between where conservation needs to occur for public water supply and where it needs to occur for other resources, whether it be trout, public beaches, or otherwise, um, is a very powerful thing to do. So we've, you know, I've gone to some meetings locally on drinking water, and I've even found other groups presenting on temperature. Um, and so with that, wrap up and just put a plug in for, for next year. If anybody's interested in collaborating on this, if anybody has any ideas, um, thoughts on what Ann and I have put out there um, this afternoon, please be in touch. Um, we're looking to, to set up a symposium for um, the annual meeting of the American Fishery Society next summer in Baltimore. Um, hopefully everything is improving by then in terms of the pandemic. Um, we, have, we, we were gonna present in Ohio this year, but obviously things fell through. Um, but again, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, if anybody has any questions at the end or you know, wants to reach out in their own time, please feel free. Thank you so much, Jonathan and Anna. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Ben and Laurie and just wanted to put another plug in for asking questions uh, so that we have plenty to talk about during the last part of the presentation. Okay, this is Ben, and uh, Lori and I work out in Region 10 of, of EPA, and we're in Seattle, and we're going to give you a brief overview of the kind of things we're seeing uh, in temperature TMDLs in our, our in our region. And Lori's going to go ahead and start with the presentation, so I'll be doing the slides. Yeah, this is Lori. Thanks for doing the slides, Ben. Sorry, can you go back to the first slide? Yeah, thanks. So um, Ben and I are happy to join you today. Thanks for inviting us to participate. Um, governments in the Pacific Northwest have been focused on temperature monitoring and restoration for over 20 years. Um, we have a fairly short presentation um, and hopefully our stories will be interesting and useful. Um, before we move on to the next slide, I want to say something about the photo in this slide. Uh, this is the South Fork Nooksack River, which is in the upper left corner of Washington State. The Washington Department of Ecology completed a TMDL for temperature on this river earlier this year. And that engineered log jam on the left bank of the river is part of a restoration effort being led by the Nooksack tribe. The log jams provide cold water refuge for fish. They enhance hyporheic flow and help stabilize the bank. Next slide, Ben, thanks. So here's our agenda. I'm gonna talk quickly about water quality standards and impairments. Ben is going to talk about some of the technical challenges and approaches in doing temperature TMDLs. 
and we're both going to talk a little bit about some of the climate change work here in Region 10. Next slide. Those are sockeye salmon in that photo. So we've been focusing on temperature as a key eco ecosystem indicator for a couple decades in the Pacific Northwest because temperature, as you probably know, affects distribution, health and survival of native salmon and other species. And we have a lot of ESA listings in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we had a lot of listings even in the 1990s. And those listings inspired a cooperative effort um, that was led by EPA to work with states and tribes on the development of numeric criteria for temperature and resulted in the development of EPA Region 10's temperature guidance document in 2003. So two of our states, Washington and Oregon, and many of our tribal governments adopted temperature criteria based on the recommendations in that 2003 guidance document. And those numeric criteria generally range from about 12 degrees C to 20 C. And the criteria apply to specific designated uses like salmodid spawning in specific locations. There are some site-specific criteria that are outside of that range as well. So on that last bullet, um, Oregon and Washington and some of our tribal governments have also adopted supplemental and, and or narrative criteria for temperature. For example, Oregon has a cold water refugia provision as well as a um, 0.3 C human use allowance provision. There are also natural condition provisions in some of our states and tribal governments, but we want to note that interpreting a natural conditions provision for temperature is challenging for many reasons. So I think we, we probably all know um, that temperature varies in a way that many other pollutants don't vary throughout the day, throughout the season, and from year to year because of numer numerous factors. And some of those factors are natural, and some of those factors are human-caused. And the way they blend together is very difficult to tease apart. So temperature, for example, is influenced by human activities like groundwater withdrawal, dams, irrigation withdrawals, deforestation, and climate change. So to estimate a natural condition um, necessitates examining those factors. So we've actually had litigation on our natural conditions provision, and I'm not going to get into that in this presentation because it's long and complicated. Um, next slide. Thanks. So we have a lot of temperature impairments and we also have a lot of TMDLs in Idaho, um, temperature TMDLs in Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. Um, you can see on this slide, we have over 36,000 miles of temperature impaired rivers, a lot of acreage of temperature impaired lakes, and in the bar graph on the right, you can see that our states have done more TMDLs for temperature than for any other pollutant. Over 2,000 temperature TMDLs and counting. Next slide. Okay, this is Ben again, and Lori is passing it back to me just for a few slides um, to talk about the technical challenges. I work in uh, water quality modeling and assessment. Um, and Lori and I sort of work together quite often. She on the programmatic side and myself in the technical side 
working in tandem to try to, to craft, well, to review TMDLs primarily for coming in from the states, but also now, and again, we do our own work and uh, we have had to um, uh, work on a TMDL for the Columbia River and that is pretty hot off the press. Uh, so that's a rare case where EPA has, has issued a, a, a TMDL. Um, and we'll have a, I have a couple examples from that technical work. Uh, one is on the lower right in this plot, and that's a, uh, a model simulation uh, from the RBM-10 model that we are applying for the Columbia River TMDL. And it's an unusual uh, model. Uh, it's quite lean in terms of how fast it can run, and we can run, and we also have quite a bit of data for the Columbia River that we can uh, generate long-term simulations, and that's a 46-year simulation. All of the that's each, each there's a you know that's that's the that's the time of the year the you know the summer is getting warmer and it's cooling off in the fall and the winter and you see all the traces from the model giving you a sense of the variation in temperature. Um, so technical challenges. Uh, the, my previous our previous presenters have already touched upon this, but maybe I'll I'll quickly go through just a summary of things that are tough about temperature TMDLs. One is that heat is not conservative, and so. Pretty much to do a temperature TMDL where you're making sense of, of what's happening across time and space, you need a, a model. And so when Lori talks about all those TMDLs we've done in the region, the vast majority of them have a model attached to them. Um, there's a variety of model tools that are being used, but the states in particular are taking the lead and they have they have modelers on staff and they're doing a lot of temperature TMDL, uh, temperature, temperature TMDLs and models associated with that. Uh, also, the load, you know, when we talk about a, a, a load for a TMDL, um, it's not easy to track temperature loads and to add them up. Um, you know, our units are kilocalories per day. They are not mass. Um, and the, uh, again, it's not conservative. So you're typically not adding loads uh, upstream of a location to, to arrive at a load at a downstream location. The model is essentially mediating all of uh, the loadings going in and what's happening in response in the river to either point source loads or atmospheric changes or uh, dam impound, impoundment of the river by dams, things like that. Um, and then folks have mentioned natural variability and climate change. So you see the variability in the lower right. Um, uh, and you know you can imagine in a TMDL, what exact, how do you deal with that natural variability in the system? Um, and then uh, and, and teasing out what's not natural about the patterns you're finding. And then the new kid on the block is climate change. Um, and uh, of course, you have all heard about climate change. Um, and I'll speak a little bit more about this in a minute. Uh, but it's, 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 as I said, it's, it's coming to the table now for us. Um, Pacific Northwest, uh, you know, when we do temperature TMDLs, this, this is just a bulleted list of the big, the big actors, you know, what, what's causing temperature change across our landscapes. Uh, you know, we have our great forests in the Northwest, um, and there is logging that goes on in management, and that can uh, eliminate riparian shade, which is critical, especially in the lower mountainous forested streams. Um, alongside that, you can have channel impacts um, and water withdrawals, uh, either from forestry or other urbanization and other activities, agriculture on the landscape. Um, and then we have uh, dams, is a, hydroelectric dams uh, are a major factor in the Northwest. Uh, they impound the rivers and that changes the geometry, the travel time and the, the temperature of our rivers. And then finally, of course, you're doing a TMDL. So you need to look at NPDES sources. Um, typically in the larger rivers, they're not a big factor. Uh, we have not found them to be a fa big factor at all in the Columbia River, which is a very big river. Um, but in the smaller watersheds, it can they can be a factor. And so, of course, the TMDLs need to account for all those sources and deal with the fact that NPDES sources are discharging heat. That heat is not conservative. It's going into these rivers and it's going downstream and it's dissipating. And you got to keep track of that and see what the magnitude is. OK, um, just a slide about each kind of sort of environment we're dealing with. Uh, you know, we have forest lands, um, again, riparian shade loss. Uh, which we do use models to um, estimate the, the and, and we, we try to look at the, the, the site potential shade in addition to the current shade and what's the difference and what is that difference doing to the to the uh, river temperatures. Lori mentioned other um, you know 
but more complicated things to model. And oftentimes they are done more qualitatively and that's things like the loss of woody debris, um, uh, the, the erosion, just potential changes to the channel uh, shape because of sediment erosion. Um, and then you have hyperreic connectivity, hyperreic flow, meaning uh, the, the, the groundwater and or the, the river itself going into gravel beds and coming out of gravel beds. And when, it, when you have that kind of complexity, uh, you have cool spots in the river. When, we, when human activity tends to, to remove a lot of these complexities and create warmer rivers. So we try to, try to address those either qualitatively and occasionally quantitatively. If we, can, if we can do it quantitatively, we will do it. But oftentimes our tools are not up to the, that challenge. I just list a couple sources, uh, oh, excuse me, a couple of models in, the, in our region that are heavily used. Uh, the heat source model developed in the state of Oregon is used by Oregon, in particularly their smaller, uh, in, the, in their forested watersheds and, and small rivers um, uh, and, and some larger rivers. And then Qual2KW, Qual2K as a national model, um, and the W on the end is that Washington has their own uh, uh, version of the model that they've tailored to their, to their purposes. Um, Qual2KW, heat source is just a temperature model. Qual2KW models, you know, nutrients, temperature, you know, pH, all sorts of things. Uh, but it does have temperature and it has a shade component where you can deal with riparian shade for your temperature TMDLs. And it has groundwater as well. Um, okay. We'll go to the next slide. Oh, and those models are one dimensional, meaning they give you a single temperature at a given a river location. So they don't give you variation across the lateral width of the river or at depth. It's a single cross-sectional average temperature that these particular models uh, give you. And it's the same, in, in fact, on the Columbia River model that we're using. Okay, uh, so those, that's forested lands and, and uh, the other one of the other big factors or sources in our region is hydroelectric dams. Um, I mentioned what they do to the geometry of a river and what that does. Um, one of the things that does uh, is it creates a temporal shift in uh, the cross sectional average temperature of a river. So I show a plot here at one of the locations on the Columbia River, which is downstream of numerous dams. Uh, so this is the combined effect of numerous upstream dams. We use the model uh, to simulate the current condition. Uh, which is the lighter blue line. And then we use models, submodels, to estimate what the free flowing river geometry would be. We run the same model with just a, sim a different geometry and we get the black line. So it would have been much cooler in this river uh, prior to the construction of the dams upstream of this location. And we call it a temporal shift. You see the, 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 the warm temperatures, uh, they do get a little higher, but they also, or everything is shifted to the right. Uh, from the summer onward into the fall on the right side of the plot. And that's, you think of the thermal inertia of these rivers, they're, they're storing more of the, the summer heat, they're not passing it down the river, they're storing it behind the dams and then they're releasing it in the fall. So the river does not cool off as fast as, fast as it would have without the dams. And I threw, out, I threw out a few more acronyms for models for your, just for your uh, information, um, that we might use different models for big rivers that have hydroelectric dams. Um, either because we want to look at two dimensions. Be, uh, so the CE Qual W2 model is a real workhorse for reservoir uh, analysis. Um, and it's two dimensional. So it meaning it doesn't give you the temperature variation across the width of the river, but it gives you the vertical. So it, it enables you to look at vertical stratification that's occurring behind a, a dam. And then I point out RBM 10. Um, you know, the TMDL program doesn't, it doesn't have a list of sort of the, you know, uh, defined models that one can apply. And um, sometimes it, it, it might be worth your while to use a, a, a particular, a special tool that's tailored to your problem. And that's the case with RBM 10, uh, which has long been developed for the Columbia River itself. It is one dimensional, but as I mentioned, it has a, some, some, some features, including the ability to do long-term simulation. Um, but it can also deal with, you know, point source of tributaries. And in a minute, I'll show you a plot of what the climate trend looks like in the Columbia River from that model. And this is the example of the Columbia River scale that we're dealing with. Um, the Columbia River uh, goes from the Canadian border at the top of the plot 
uh, winds its way downstream. It, the Snake River comes in from the right side uh, and meets the Columbia, and then the Columbia goes out to the ocean across the bottom of the of the plot. And all all of these um, squares with the uh, little bullseyes, those are all dams and locations where we both monitor the river and where we use the model to estimate what's happening with the temperatures and what the source impacts are. Uh, and when we run the model, um, we get output like this. So this is, and, and this is gonna be the only sort of data plot I'll that'll be shown here, uh, just because I want you to see it. Um, so this is, uh, and hopefully it's interesting to you. Um, these are monthly plots. These are monthly average temperatures of the Columbia River uh, flowing from right to left in each plot. So you have the border on the right, the Canadian border, and, and the, the river's flowing down to the ocean at the left side, river mile zero. And uh, what we do with the models is we, first we calibrate the model to simulate the current condition well. And so the red squares are the uh, current condition. Um, if I plotted the data, the measured data for the river, they would align with those red squares quite well, okay? So you have the current condition, and then we make just one change to the model. We change the geometry. And we, we make the river flow like a free-flowing river in the model, everything else being the same. Same weather, same time frame, everything same inputs from tributaries, everything. We isolate the dam impact that way. And what this is showing is the cumulative impacts. We've, in this, these plots, we've taken the dams, they're either all in for the current condition and they're all out in the free flowing condition. And there's like, yeah, there's uh, pretty much all those locations, almost all those locations you see in the plots are dam locations. So there's multiple dams going on here, are shown here. And we do it by month and you can see how the patterns change. So just the general point being, we can look at models to see when dams are having an impact, what the scale of the impact is, and what the pattern is. And so you'll see, for example, Grand Coulee in July in the upper left. Grand Coulee is the first dam at River Mile 600, going from right to left. You go to the Canadian border, and then the next dam is Grand Coulee, and you'll see that actually the current condition is colder than it would have been with a free-flowing river. So this is why we use models, because people might generally say, well, dams are bad. They're going to increase the temperature of the river in the summer. And Careful, we use models to understand why that might not always be the case. Um, and so in this case, Cooley is actually releasing colder water than it would have under a free flowing condition. However, when you move down to the lower right side and look at the fall, uh, you have a, a very massive difference in the negative from Cooley because it's stored all this heat in the summer and it's not, it's, it, it's uh, not passing the cold water from the border downstream, it's passing that stored heat downstream and that's why the temperature is much higher in the lower right um, in the current condition. So just a little teaser there in terms of uh, how we use models to estimate uh, impacts. Okay, um, and then I think this is my last slide, we'll find out. Uh, um, climate change, um, you know, is we, uh, we've all seen it coming um, that, uh, you know, back, we've been working on these issues, as Lori said, for a long time. And in the early days, climate change was on the horizon and people were saying, you know, what about climate change? And there really wasn't information that uh, it had hit yet. And, and a lot of the work, as you all know, has been projecting future climate change. But as the decades pass, we start getting more temperature data in. And we also have researchers looking at um, relationships and correlations and using models. And, and we now can start to see that, unfortunately, climate change is real. It is, and it is not only, and not only that, but it is already manifested now. And so as we've done this TMDL, we realized, you know, temperature T or any TMDL is, is a picture of the current condition and the current impacts. So that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with the here and the now in a TMDL. You're not, you're, uh, anyway, you're not, it, okay, we'll leave it at that. And so we said, okay, well, is it, do we have an estimate is, is there an estimate of what has happened to the Columbia River to date as a current source of, temp, of thermal impairment? And the answer we came up with was yes. And it's both a growing body of literature of people studying rivers, including the Columbia River, and then also our own model analysis. And this plot is, and then, and just to point out, so in our TMDL, we really emphasize that, or we, we focus on what is the baked in impact already that we see. What is the, the temperature? How much warmer is the Columbia River already as of today due to climate change? And um, to do that, again, we went to the literature and we did, we did sort of a, a, you know, a synthesis of everything we could find. And one of the things we had was the model in our possession, RBM 10. And uh, 
from a baseline of, we, we determined that it's, it's reasonable to start in the 1960s as a baseline in, uh, of when uh, anthropogenic climate change starts to show a signal in the, in the air temperature readings. Um, and our model runs, we don't, we don't have the 60s, but we go from the 70s to present. And this is a simulation of each successive decade uh, with uh, the average temperature in the Columbia River at, the, at this particular dam in the downstream reach. And you'll see, uh, it, I was surprised at this result because it is so clear how each decade is, it's like a layer cake and it's just simply getting warmer out there. And so that our TMDL does include this information um, as an important factor in what's happening in the Columbia River. Okay, I'm gonna hand it back to Lori now to close it out with a few more slides. Yeah, thanks, Ben. We have two slides left, and this is another climate change project I wanna to mention to you. Um, when the Washington Department of Ecology started work on the South Fork Nooksack TMDL, uh, EPA's Office of Research and Development initiated a parallel project um, working with the state of Washington, as well as two tribal governments, the Nooksack tribe and the Lummi Nation, um, to look at the um, estimated future impacts of climate change in a couple different ways. Um, in the first document on the left, the quantitative assessment, uh, EPA um, worked with um, a fairly large group of regulators and scientists to estimate the impact of climate change on water temperature in the basin in 2020, 2040, and 2080. So what they did is they downscaled um, climate data from global climate change models. And they also used hydrologic models um, to predict the way that runoff would change during the year because um, there are um, there are glaciers at the top of this watershed and also, of course, snow accumulating. Um, in the document on the right, the qualitative assessment, EPA worked with the same um, governments and scientists to do a reach by reach assessment of climate change vulnerability in the watershed. And then as a second step, um, they assessed the potential for um, different BMPs to compensate for the predicted future climate change impacts. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is an example of the work that was done in the second document, the quali uh, qualitative assessment. So this is a color-coded graphic and I'm not going to go through all the words um, on this slide, um, but I want to summarize um, the approach that was used. So on the um, vertical axis on the left-hand side, you can see the different river reaches. So that first reach goes from river mile zero to 14.3. And the climate change impacts are summarized on the top row. So for example, um, you can see in that first reach, um, the high level impacts, which are the orange or red squares, um, are predicted to be um, caused by elevated summer temperatures, reduced summer low flow, and increased winter peak flows. So after these tables were assembled for the entire watershed and all the tributaries, the team then worked collaboratively to examine whether the existing salmon restoration plans contained BMPs that compensated for these changes and they use that work to then prioritize um, where the available funding money would go. Um, next slide, I think this might be the end. 
There's um, our contact information. Um, as Ben said, I'm in the TMDL program. Ben works in our technical support group, and we're happy to answer your questions or to um, refer you on to folks at any of our Region 10 states who are doing TMDL work. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. Um, I am so happy to have heard from all of you and I'm excited to have a whole bunch of good questions uh, already flowing in. Um, again, keep, keep asking the questions. We have about 15 more minutes and I know that our presenters um, have generously offered to stick around for as long as they can to answer all of your questions. Um, so let me just bring up my relatively not exciting last slide. Um, again, there's a little reminder of how to send a question in. Um, I'm gonna start off with just a couple of relatively small detail questions about the uh, the most recent presentation. Uh, we have one that's just saying, uh, what's the depth of the temperature measurements on the Columbia River and its tributaries? What's the depth of the of the Columbia River? Or of the temperature measurements? Like where are they pulling those measurements? Yeah, um, uh, yeah the, um, the federal dam system uh, does temperature monitoring at each dam, both upstream and downstream of each dam. And those are long-term monitoring sites. Uh, and the upstream site, it's at varying depths um, in the forebay of the dam. Uh, so there's not a single depth. Um, in the in the downstream, you know, you, now you're in the you're in the tail race of the dam, and that's where you know the water's spilling out from the um, from the powerhouse, um, and so it's really quite shallow there and turbulent. So that's where we use the measurements to to, to check the cross sectional average temperature of the river. Great, thank you. Um, another question kind of is targeted at the Maryland folks, um, but I'd be interested to hear from both of you actually about setting the natural conditions. Uh, so this question is, um, in Montana, we consider what the temperature is compared to an estimated natural conditions to develop our TMDLs. In Maryland, um, how do you consider the natural conditions for those cold water streams? Can you repeat real quick? Because I, I just found all the questions and I'm trying to look through them. So I'm not sure which which one we're on. Uh, so this one, um, I'll, I'll read it again. I'll paraphrase a little bit. Um, in Montana, we consider what the temperature is compared to estimated natural conditions in developing our TMDLs. Um, in Maryland, uh, how do you consider the natural conditions uh, for these cold water streams? Ah, okay, I see, I see the question now from Christine. Um, yeah, we do include a natural component, um, and that is we do a modeling scenario based on an all forested watershed. So given that, um, what the temperature would be if the, if the watershed was all forested with no anthropogenic modification. Um, and I will say that we were pretty surprised that it was a large portion um, of the actual baseline condition. So yeah, even, even in a forested watershed, um, we were probably getting 18 or 19 degrees. So we didn't have a, a lot of a lot to go up from there. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, this one is back to the West Coast. I'm going to try to bounce back and forth. Uh, ben and Lori, please describe the impacts to salmon and migration from the dam impacts, the later warm water in spring and the hotter water in fall. I think I, Lori and I are probably each wondering who's going to answer this. When you say Ben and Lori, you get both of us at the same time. <laughs> you you start, Ben. Okay, I'll start. Um, so. I'm not a I'm not a fish biologist. Um, I'm a modeler, but so I, I'm usually handing this information off to someone who understands fish and fish runs and spawning. Um, but there are I, I will just say that um, 
there, there is, it, it's not just the spring and the fall, but also the summer is warmer. So in, in the spring, we don't, you know, the, the fact that the water is um, cooler with the dams tends to, to, to say, well, in a temperature TMDL, we're not gonna be concerned about things becoming colder. We're worried about when it's warmer. And that's, although there are some effects I know from, from the, and, and some concerns in some quarters about the cooler rivers in terms of the spring because of, it changes the heat, the um, heat need degree days that are uh, happening to the, the, the spawned eggs that are gonna emerge as fish. Um, but uh, this, the prolonged summer effect, the, the high temperatures are just a, a clear stress to the fish. The fall, it depends on the species, but if there's a species of salmon that are fall spawning, then you, the temperature um, affects both the fish that's trying to spawn uh, its health, and then there's questions about the viability of the, the eggs and the, the hatching to and spawn, the spawning success in the fall, if the fish is in the area at that time and spawns at that time. I also want to put a plug in for um, the cold water refuge report that um, EPA um, worked with the states and other um, scientists and agencies on um, for the Columbia River. So in addition to everything that Ben said, those fish in a nat natural environment, they need and will find these cold water refuge spots, which often occur at the confluence of a colder tributary with the main stem. So on an especially hot day, they go and they hang out there and they need that cold water refuge um, during their migration. So our TMDL actually included um, cold water refuge targets in it. And you know, those kinds of targets aren't, they don't really fit into the traditional TMDL model, um, but they are, necessary in order to attain standards. Great, thank you. Um, this question actually I think could be interesting to hear from any and all of our presenters or kind of from both Maryland and Region 10. Um, do the allocations target attainment of the standards specifically or sometimes is the goal to remove all of or as much as possible of the human coast the human caused uh, temperature load. This is Jonathan. <laughs> Please let me answer that one. I mean, in out west, it's a different perspective. You know, I, I lived in Montana. I went to school out there for a little while. The state of Maryland is a highly, highly manipulated landscape. There's nothing natural about any part of this state, really. Even the western part in Appalachia has been logged over. Uh, multiple times. So, you know, to the, the concept of getting back to some pre-settlement era or to remove um, stressors from the landscape, I mean, we really have to work very hard with landowners um, and, and the working landscapes that exist in this state. And I'm sure it's in a lot of places too. Um, so we, we're viewing it more as, you know, particularly, for example, agriculture. You know, how can we keep agriculture and primary production strong in Maryland and still maintain these other natural resource assets. So it's it's super complex. I mean, that's that's why we're all here learning together today, but that's, that's how it is, at least here in Maryland. Yeah, uh, this is Lori. I would say just generally, um, our allocations target the standards specifically, um, just because, um, that's the easiest way to develop a TMDL um, and more closely aligns with the with the regulatory requirements. Great, thank you. Um, I have one more, I think a lot of the other questions that people asked earlier on have been now touched on, um, but do the temperature TMDLs apply to the entire water column? Uh, this sort of gets back to those refugia or only to certain depths um, or kind of a, a depth average? And, the, and this can be for anybody. Uh, 
Yeah, I think it, this has been, um, I've seen a variety of, of, of things done. Um, typically, if it's a smaller river and it's well mixed, then you just have a single temperature, you know, single, <clears throat> single location in the water column because you know it's not varying. But when dams are involved and you have thermal stratification caused by the dams, I've seen that um, some TMDLs go after that uh, directly or indirectly. Um, and uh, the um, Columbia TMDL actually is focused on the tail races in the well mixed part of the river um, because that's where we have the the model estimates of of one you know one are one dimensional. So so we don't we don't um, dive into the thermal stratification. Uh, directly, um, and it's not that stratified a system. The, they are run of river dams, so the stratification is not very great. Um, if you're dealing with a big dam and you're concerned, and, and, and for whatever reason there's issues with the vertical stratification that the standards touch upon, then that that particular TMDL would have to deal with the vertical structure. Yeah, for Maryland, where our um, not really looking at, at temperature stratification either. Uh, most of the areas that we're working on, again, we're in the first watershed TMDL development. Um, so obviously this may not apply across the street, the state like Jonathan was talking in Western Maryland, but we're talking about a first group or water stream. So um, the depth is relatively shallow. Um, and so we have not focused on that. Great, thank you. Um, this one is specifically for you all in Maryland. Um, how are the 50 foot buffers accepted by the public and what are the restrictions associated with those buffer areas? So I love this question um, because we have had some commentary with our stakeholders I didn't go into a lot of stakeholder involvement in my presentation, but I'm really glad that Jonathan did. Um, so what 50 foot um, we have looked into and found several literature sources that say 50 foot buffers are appropriate, um, but especially in the urban watershed that we're working in, we were told by the county that there was no way they could get to 100% buffer that the most is, 90% buffer. So yeah, certainly there's um, private land and county land and state land and you know 100% buffer just would not be feasible. So we have worked with them and worked that into our modeling and um, you know just really appreciated their feedback. Great, right. that actually gets to one of the questions that I have, which is, um, I know from talking to you all before the presentation um, that you've done a lot of work to engage with partners kind of within different parts of government and also from nonprofits and community groups. Can you talk a little bit about the process that you use to identify and kind of, uh, Jonathan, you, 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 you talked about selling to, to partners, um, how, did you go about that? And what have you learned? Kind of what are some of your biggest lessons of engaging people with this process? I mean, the, the first thing is for sure, you, you have to let people know that you know where you, you want to go. Um, to show up at a meeting and, and sort of ask to a bunch of a bunch of folks who are in this, you know, in the environmental sector, like, you know, we're trying we're trying to do something with temperature, we're trying to do something with climate change. I mean if you're not creating a very sharp ask of people they're kind of gonna walk away slowly um so for us it you know I, I really made the point to my supervisors early on is like this needs to be about the fishery um temperature is obviously driving the modeling um but the modeling is there to support the fishery at the end of the day so from early on um, we began conversations with with the department of natural resources and basically asked them what information are you sitting on related to temperature and related to trout fisheries in the state of Maryland? Um, and then from there, it's been a lot of conversations to parse out what's valuable, what's not. Um, and from there also, you know, internally, we've begun to then identify, like I kind of mentioned in the presentation, what puts the fishery and the, and the, and the thermal stability of the watershed um, at risk? What are the risks 
to temperature? What are the risks to the trout fishery? Um, you know, we, you know, the EPA folks talked a lot about dams. You know, those, in, those include farm ponds in Maryland. There's a lot of uh, thermal hotspots across the landscape. So now one of our big GIS layers we're trying to develop is a comprehensive list of depressions in the landscape that are either filling up temporarily during our, you know, rainier periods of the year or are, are holding, you know, non-stratified water year round. So that's everything from our large high head dams that are feeding Baltimore City all the way towards, you know, small irrigation puddles um, that could be a half acre in size or even less, but are located in cold water areas. So looking at risks, you know, asking that sharp question up front, what are we trying to manage? Looking at the risks to that management goal, and then also other resources that are associated with what, with what you're trying to manage. And that's kind of why I was trying to make the point in my presentation about water supply and use class P. Um, you know, the Columbia Basin is a great example because that, you know, those dams are there for multiple purposes. So, you know, the salmonid fishery, the, 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 the salmon are, are, you know, crucial to the identity of the natural heritage out there, but there's other purposes for that water being dammed up. And, you know, sometimes you can't find a common ground and you just, you know, you have to, you have to deal with it in other ways in, in, a, in a legal context. But I think here in Maryland, um, we've got some opportunities to deal with things um outside of that legal framework to try and you know achieve multiple um natural resource management goals simultaneously and one of those we're trying to do is trout with water supply because a lot of those trout waters we have are very very high quality drinking water and irrigation supplies and i think the state would like to keep them that way again because there's an emphasis in maryland that you know we want to maintain our primary production as a state we want to maintain agriculture um as part of the livelihood here um for marylanders so that provides an opportunity to collaborate with other stakeholders. So identify the management goal and then looking at risks and other resources associated can really give you a, a framework of where, you know, where you want to go. Great. Thank you. Ben and Lori, do either of you guys want to talk about kind of partnerships and, and engaging people outside of EPA and the states to, to work on these issues? You know, if our state partners were here with us, I would invite them to talk about that. Um, so, yeah. Well, if any of the state partners in the Pacific Northwest are here, you can raise your hand and I can let you, I, I, I can put you on the spot. But <laughs> otherwise, um, do any of our wonderful presenters have any last uh, comments, questions for each other, uh, things you'd like to add? No, thanks. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I will be posting uh, the recording of this uh, on our website uh, in the next day or so, depending on how long it takes to process. Uh, and so if you have any other questions or want any more information, please follow up and let me know. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you so much to all of our presenters. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.